Thanks. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for joining um, you know today's uh, two lectures. And uh, sorry for what happened last time. Today also we are having some kind of a trouble. So, uh, but hopefully in the future we will uh, you know, take care of it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about um, glycans as drugs, what we wanted to discuss last time, uh, and then continue on to NNO glycans. And I have uh, put up uh, obviously slides for NNO glycans. We have a next lecture, which was we were supposed to today, which is the sialic acids. So what I've done is I have essentially taken some slides from sialic acid lecture, added on to the NNO glycans and created a new slide which I uploaded today on Blackboard, uh, which hopefully you all know about. Yeah, okay, thanks for telling me that you know it. Um, okay, all right, so let's um, quickly go through, um, oops, this is classes for glycans. This is not glycans, as drugs. Okay. Um, all right. So why why don't I do this? I'll do classic of glycans first, and then we'll do glycans as drugs. Okay. Just because I don't want to disturb the setup now that we have it working. <clears throat> okay. So um, you know we did talk a little bit about classes for glycans um, last time, and essentially for today's objectives, uh, other than salic acid, which are not listed here, what I would like for you all to essentially know and remember uh, is the key principles and some of the important structures that uh, are part of um, the entire category of N and O glycans. <clears throat> um, how glycans are categorized, what do they represent, what are the typical roles. We're gonna discuss few roles. And remember my emphasis has been in uh, the idea that there are specific glycan structures that do specific things. Now that is extremely difficult and uh, to really discover primarily because of the complexity of glycans. But I think we will move in that direction and I hope uh, that you would, you would pick up on the message as to how the difficult that is. Uh, we would also want to know a little bit about N-glycans and biosynthesis because it's absolutely phenomenal. You would really enjoy um, you know, how these are synthesized and simply wonder as to how nature came up with something of this sort. And likewise, we'll do work back for O-glycans and we'll study salic acid, which is not really mentioned on this slide. <clears throat> anyway, so this is the overall um, you know, um, arrangement of the lecture. Well, let's not spend time because we're already too late. Uh, but um, basically, all right, so I don't know how to get rid of that. But basically, <clears throat> uh, there are several different types of glycan conjugates. And you're going to see these four words being mentioned a whole lot across and people use them interchangeably which is an which is a major issue but i think it's important for you as students of um, you know, glycobiology or glycochemistry to understand as to what are the real differences between uh, these uh, these molecules so glycoproteins glyco modifying a protein right so protein is the most important component and on top of that we have glycan and generally 60 to 70% of proteins that occur in nature are actually glycoproteins, right? And pretty soon you would learn that glycans do control a whole uh, you know, lot of things. Uh, likewise, glycolipids, glycan modification of lipids, right? So there are lots of different lipids. <clears throat> and then you have um, glycan chains that are introduced onto lipids. And these are also absolutely important. Uh, you know, uh, lipid bilayers and uh, wraps and those kinds of things are essentially all uh, arising from the glycolipids. And that's a huge category. We have a lecture that's going to come up, uh, which is on uh, lysosomal uh, storage disorders. We talked a little bit about, uh, you know, what happens when these kinds of glycolipids, um, you know, the biosynthesis or actually degradation of those is, is disrupted. Then we have proteoglycan. All right, so remember the protein component comes before the glycan component. So the idea here is that the protein or the protein component is a smaller component. The glycan is the huge component, is a larger component. And these are really macromolecules. Glycoproteins can also be large, right? They can be really, really large. But likewise, invariably, proteoglycans are also quite large. <clears throat> Um, and this is primarily uh, uh, arising from the glycosaminoglycan chains. 
And then we have peptidoglycans, right? So you would see in bacteria, there are peptidoglycans that play a major role with regard to cell function. There is a drug that targets the bacterial cell wall and its biosynthesis, one of the very old drugs. <clears throat> and generally for this particular course, we are not going to talk a whole lot about peptidoglycans. But remember, peptidoglycans are also very, very important. They are, they are alternating copolymers of N-acetyl glucosamine and N-acetyl muraminic acid. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so when you say nitroproteins, are we talking about like black like, you know, or black and chain proteins, which is like small sugar molecules, like monosaccharides and black acid? Right. So glycoproteins typically are never refer never uh, 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 referred to as having gag chains. Right. Gags are always present on the protein component, which are proteoglycans. That's the that's the difference. Okay. All right, very good. Now, this is a figure that you have seen earlier, and generally this figure summarizes the category of different glycans in total. All right, and so um, you know Ajit Warki tried to attempt to essentially bring together all the different types of glycans uh, out here, <clears throat> and uh, the the idea here is for example that this this is the proteoglycan right this is the protein component and then you have the glycan component sorry i should be using the cursor so that uh, the teams on the other side can all right so this is the protein component and that's the gag component all right and number of times there are some proteoglycans known that have only one gag chain but number of times there have multiple gag chains it's not necessary to have only GAC chains of the same type. You can actually have chains that are different on the same proteoglycan. So this is actually true. You can actually have a heparan sulfate chain connected to a protein core on which you have a chondroitin sulfate chain. <clears throat> and a number of these types of proteoglycans are known. Likewise, glycosaminoglycan, which is not connected to a protein core, is hyaluronic acid or hyaluronic acid. And that also plays a major role as, as you're going to learn in short while. This is typically expressed and secreted outside the cell. Okay? And it can also exist within the cell, but the, uh, the mechanism is secreted outside the cell. Um, and then you have glycoproteins. And shown here, for example, you see that this is the protein component, right? That's the protein that most people typically know of. And then once in a while, you might have an asparagine or a serine theory in which there is an O-glycan or there is an end glycan. So that's the topic of our discussion for today. And there are glycolipids. There's a lipid that is actually present in the lipid bilayer. And then there are the glycan components. So these different symbols are actually all representing different monosaccharides. <clears throat> and then uh, you can actually have a GPI anchored protein, which is also to a certain extent, we can uh, classify that GPI essentially uh, belonging to the glycan core. Then, there are glycoproteins that may be present within the cell that are O glucosamine and acetyl glucosamine linked, just one O linked monosaccharide. And that plays a very important role, and I hope to uh, cover that uh, in today's discussion. So we'll probably go for a little more than an hour today, given the fact that we have quite uh, a lot to cover. Okay, so. Um, glycans, as we have uh, learned in the past lectures, there are quite a few monosaccharides. It's extremely difficult to really come up with a representation of these glycans on a two-dimensional level, different from, uh, significantly difficult from organic chemistry. So what um, most people have started using is this particular representation, which is heavily used in this book, which is in essence uh, one of the um, uh, sort of uh, compilation of all the different topics. And I think you should keep uh, using this book every now and then. It is freely available on the web. Uh, it has come off because of the NIH um, you know, emphasis on the topic. And I think Dr. Warty has uh, made it completely free. So I think whenever you need to learn a little bit about glycans, this is a, sort of a first resource that you should go to. So the different uh, symbols actually are um, <clears throat> uh, different shapes and different colors, primarily because there are just too many. But some of the symbols you should try to remember, such as glucose, such as N-acetyl, glucosamine, blue, uh, circle, and square, 
uh, galactose or N-acetylgalactosamine, mannose. These are the important ones. For example, fucose. Uh, there is sialic acid. This is sialic acid. Okay, so these are uh, fairly common, and then you're going to see a lot more, which are half colored up and down, ioduronic acid, uh, glucuronic acid. <clears throat> and after a little while, it becomes too difficult to remember all. But the common ones you should be able to figure out as you keep referring to these anandoglycans quite often, you will be able to remember these. <clears throat> anyway, this is, uh, this is straight from the figure from the essentials of glycobiology. You can see that these are the common ones. And so this is one way to represent, simply connecting the different monosaccharides and then writing the linkage, for example, here, or for example, here, right? So this is glucosamine or n glucosamine, which is connected to asparagine, where the linkage is beta, and this one is beta-4, so these two are connected beta-4, 1 to 4, beta-4 essentially means beta-1 to 4, uh, and this is mannose. And this is n acetyl glucosamine. This, for example, is uh, what is it? Beta two. Okay, even I can't read it. Um, and then uh, you have galactose, and then you have salic acid. Okay, you can see that you you not only have a simple structure. For example, uh, you know you have this chain, but then you can also have bifurcation. Right, this is two chain. And there are some others who typically use something of this sort. A representation where you actually write out the abbreviated versions of the names, right? And that's more direct. You write the linkage, you write the type of linkage, alpha, beta, and in that fashion, try to um, you know, give an idea about what the structure is. And I think to a large extent, this particular representation is becoming more and more common, right? <clears throat> okay, stop me uh, anytime if then you have a question. All right, I want to cover quickly cover on the very broad category of roles of glycan. Once again, this the glycans play a large number of different roles, and I think one of the emphasis of nearly all programs that are being that are being conducted today in the U.S. and the world um, uh, outside too is to identify as to what are the roles of glycans. It is a very challenging field given the fact that the structures are too many. And given the fact that nature uses a lot of different structures for similar purpose. So identifying the specific role for a glycan is an extremely difficult proposition. But I'm going to present some examples to you as to what the roles are in general and hope to emphasize upon you that glycans are extremely important. Protein folding. I'm going to discuss one particular class of how uh, if proteins are not folded, then glycans come around and glycans are the reason that proteins get to fold. And this is primarily in the endoplasmic reticulum, ER. Glycans obviously bind to a number of different proteins, right? There are um, uh, you know, numerous examples known in which if you eliminate a glycan chain on a protein, the protein is not really functional, right? And that could be because of several reasons. A protein may not be functional because it simply doesn't reach the target site or is simply not absorbed or is not stable, right? But, and so these reasons all essentially say that we need to have a glycan. For example, deglycosylated human beta chorionic gonadotropin binds to the receptor rate but simply does not stimulate it. Now, this goes a little bit further than all of the examples I just, just told you. For example, it's not about stability, it's not really about transportation, it's not really about availability. None of these. This essentially means that the glycan structure plays a role in function, right? If you have a glycan, then something happens either to the protein conformation or to the, to the site where it is binding. That's the important part. So I think these examples are going to accrue more and more as more and more people study, um, you know, um, you know glyco, glycoproteins and in general glycans. They can actually also modulate function, which is an added important role. Uh, here's an example, tyrosine phosphorylation of uh, EGRF and insulin receptor is modulated by neighboring sulfur surface gangliosides containing a defined sequence. Okay, pretty, uh, pretty important piece, uh, primarily because, um, you know, a lot of different gangliosides, you know, glycolipids come together uh, and they engineer this phosphorylation, which uh, is extremely important, which means that you can only have this signal. Phosphorylation is generally a signal to turn on something. So you can only have the signal if you have the appropriate uh, localization of the receptor. 
otherwise the signal is simply not in use, which is pretty impressive. <coughs> And uh, I was mentioning to you about stability. So heparin binding growth factors are actually protected from degradation primarily because heparin binds to these proteins and therefore they are not chopped off. So heparin actually, heparin and other glycosinoglycans can actually serve as a reservoirs. Depending on how much they release, you can actually have an extended release, which is also very important from drug delivery point of view. This is also very important. Yes, Sam, go ahead. So uh, I just want to go back to the so you know there's um, certain like sequences that that we just see it in the internet sequence like oh code like oscillation is probably gonna occur here. So just because it's there, does that mean that you're gonna get like a similar glycan each time? Or is that one is like so much very Yeah, very good question. Uh, excellent question. Just for the people who are um, uh, online, the question is that just because asperagine, for example, is there, would you ever get um, you know that to be glycosylated, and would you get the same sequence um, you know uh, as uh, as other uh, you know asperagines? So I think it's uh, that's the challenging part. So not all asperagines would be glycosylated. There is actually a, a software. There's actually a tool that has been put together based on research that you, you need a specific um, you know, uh, you know, uh, sequon uh, in which asperagine has to be located in order to glycosylate it. And yet, that's not 100% um, you know, true all the time. And number two, that you may have glycosylated chains differing in structure, both spatially as well as temporally. And those principles are still being enunciated in terms of how does regulation arise and why. Uh, so uh, yes, indeed, it's, it's an extremely important uh, question uh, and research area to, uh, uh, to work in. Okay, um, can I go forward? Yeah, all right. There are other roles that I think I have already covered a little bit in my um, uh, you know, teaser uh, lecture. Glycans um, um, are important with regard to blood uh, uh, you know, type recognition, as you all know, A and B, for example, do not mix. Blood groups A and B, they do not mix. And the entire thing is all dependent on the glycosyl chains that are actually present on the vascular line. <clears throat> and these structures are extended. And, and a number of times, these structures, um, you know, could be very small, as for example, A, B, and O, right? So for example, this is the, um, you know, sugar chain uh, uh, on glycoproteins, Whereas for the B type, you actually have um, a galactosamine, right? And for the A type, you have n acetyl galactosamine. And that makes all the difference. These small chain changes essentially ensure that the antibodies that you generate are different. They are able to recognize these different epitopes on the protein, glycoproteins. And therefore, when you mix, they actually generate uh, an immune reaction or agglutination. <coughs> um, but you would be surprised, and this is, I think, uh, very interesting to know that one of the, uh, oops, I don't know why I clicked it. Uh, let's see this one, right? Ah. Um, that um, uh, Dr. Hoffmeister, who is going to come and lecture you um, uh, just about two or three, uh, maybe next time or after that. Um, uh, discovered that if you remove salic acid, okay, uh, from glycoproteins that are present on platelet surfaces, not if you remove, if nature removes salic acid from the uh, glycoproteins that are present on platelet surfaces, then those platelets essentially are taken up by um, hepatocytes and cleared from circulation. That's actually a marker for removal of platelets. That means the body says that these are the platelets that I don't need. And I think that's very important. Why? Because essentially that means platelet life within our bloodstream is controlled by the sialic acid residue that is present on the glycoprotein uh, decorating the, the platelet surface, right? So it's pretty phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. In that fashion, for those of you who are interested in discovering drugs, you could actually extend the life of platelets. 
by designing molecules that would prevent that sialic acid from being removed, right? And actually, she has already worked in that area. Uh, but uh, um, so glycan, glycans are really uh, important for uh, you know, clearance of so many different things. And this is something that I have pointed out uh, earlier too, in terms of self versus non-self, the way microbes are recognized, the way body recognizes microbes, the way microbes try to fool the body by developing its glycans, which are very similar to our glycans. And therefore, our body feels that this is basically self and it allows the microbes to enter our uh, uh, bloodstream. Those things are also governed by the glycans that we have on the, on the proteins, for example, <clears throat> okay? So, all right. So with all of that, so, so all of these are examples of NNO glycans and sialic acid. Right? All of these are examples. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the structure. And I think this is important primarily because it will give you a quick idea about the diversity of structures and how much of research is actually needed in order to discover uh, the different roles. Why does nature produce so many different things? And yes, indeed, nature produces uh, these apparently at random. But is that really true? Right, and uh, our, our work as far as glycosmal glycans is concerned essentially tries to show that that's not really the case. Nature produces these with some reason. And I think if you discover this, then hopefully we can identify so many different sequences that might actually become drugs. Okay, so N-glycans, as I told you last time, N-glycans are covalently attached to asparagine residues, <clears throat> okay? The beta-1, um, asparagine is the most common linkage um, and um, this is a sequon that I was mentioning to um, uh, earlier in an answering Sam's question, right? So you had an asparagine X serine or threonine sequon. Uh, but once again, uh, it's not that all of these asparagines will be modified, okay? Um, and then typically they are going to share a common core structure. This is primarily coming from biosynthesis, which I have on the next slide, okay? If you look at the structure, the asparagine, for example, this is where the protein is. Asparagine could be anywhere along the protein, let's say 100, residue number 100, right? And then what happens is that you can get several different types of N glycan structures. These glycan structures are, have several antenna or antennary, biantenary or triantenary. So you can have uh, N acetyl glucosamine, N acetyl glucosamine. Uh, and then mannose, and after that, there is a di uh, divergence into mannose, mannose, and this is the fundamental unit, the minimum fundamental unit that is needed in order for um, the glycoprotein to be secreted outside from the ER, okay? Following this, so much of post biosynthesis maturation occurs in the body, uh, and you can have these kinds of decorations, such as the mannose being removed, like an acetyl, uh, Glucosamine being introduced, then you can have a galactose being introduced, and then you can actually have a sialic acid. And sometimes you can have multiple sialic acids. <clears throat> and note that depending on what you have here, for example, galactose and what its moiety is in terms of connections, you can have sialic acid one, two, three, several different types. <clears throat> okay, so it may seem to you that these appear to be too complicated and random, but that is not really the case. There is considerable level of specificity involved in biosynthesis. <clears throat> yeah. Can I go forward? Yeah? All right. Uh, no questions from other side. All right. <clears throat> now, this is the fascinating biosynthesis that I think I want you to know about, all right? Uh, and to me, this is absolutely stunning. Obviously, I don't expect you to remember any of this, uh, but I want you to understand the principles in general. And for researchers, I want you to be, to be able to use some of the very simple principles in order to turn off biosynthesis, okay? <clears throat> so that you can understand as to, if you want to turn off biosynthesis in your research, what should you do? And that will hopefully help you understand <clears throat> the role of the glycan that you might be investigating. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And basically, it consists of a large number of steps that basically starts from um, uh, uh, phosph uh, phosph phosphorylated dolicol, which is the lipid uh, 
And the way that it is organized is that the phosphate group is on the outside. Okay? And that's where uh, the biosynthesis starts. Now, as you can imagine, in order to generate, what are we trying to generate here? At the end, we are essentially trying to generate this kind of a core, right? So you have this core, which I presented to you in the last, last slide. And this 14 sugar core is being generated at the end. Why is it? Because the way nature does it, 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 it uh, biosynthesizes a protein, for example, from the ribosome. The ribosome is, key, is, is making the, the protein. And then once in a while, what happens is you have the sequon that is presented. That sequon needs to be glycosylated. So it is not that after you generate asparagine that you add an acetyl glucosamine, then you add an acetyl glucosamine, then you add mannose. That is not how it is biosynthesized. What is biosynthesized is you generate the 14 residue unit, 14 sugar unit <clears throat> on uh, the dolichol diphosphate and it is transferred and block. And that's one of the most important steps uh, for the protein to then, then undergo uh, quality control, post-processing. <clears throat> okay, And without it, <clears throat> uh, it would not. So there are a number of enzymes that are involved. And I don't want to go into the details of every little enzyme. But the first step, uh, essentially, in all these steps, okay, in all these steps, what is the common part? The common part is you need the sugar to be activated. You need the sugar to have a, 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 a bond, which, when cleaved, generates energy, and that's why the, that's the driving force for the reaction to go forward. What is that bond? That bond arises from UDP phosphate and then the sugar, okay, or GDP, UDP or GDP. So this kind of a substrate has to be made available. Once the substrate is made available, and there is an enzyme, for example, ALG7 is the enzyme, <clears throat> right? Um, so when there is a substrate that, that is made available, then the enzymatic reaction works, the UDP becomes a mono, um, you know, phosphate, and the sugar is basically transformed onto <clears throat> the the uh, the other substrate okay and that happens with every sugar so in that fashion there are these different 14 steps that typically um, you know generate the entire thing so that's point number one so if, if for example um, uh, if for example you were to um, in, in, if you wanted to eliminate glycosylation of a protein you could actually use a small molecule, tunicomycin, which is an analog of UDP and acetyl glucosamine, which inhibits the first step. So this step could be inhibited, and then the protein would not really be glycosylated at all. So if it is expressed, if it, is, if it does something, you will be able to uh, observe its effect. So that's very useful to know what enzyme would basically play a role. <clears throat> now, um, the second important thing is, that at some point after half of the assembly has been done, that this unit, through the action of an enzyme called flipase, flips from an outside in to inside out form. Okay, phenomenal regulation. Okay, and then it continues basically uh, leading up to the biosynthesis. Um, our oligosaccharide uh, uh, transferase, which then transfers onto the asparagine. And that's how the glycoprotein is generated in the endoplasmic reticulum. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? Is it clear? These are some very simple points that I want you to uh, know, primarily because you won't really see something of this sort <coughs> elsewhere. Absolutely phenomenal. Right? And uh, when Dr. Doms is going to come here and talk a little bit, she is probably going to touch upon this aspect uh, more than I have done. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't get what is it? No, in the sense, here it seems like a translocation, but it's basically simply a flip around the same point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can make a figure that goes on and on. <clears throat> 
Okay, very good. Okay, so after the end block synthesis, you can eat the, you can have the glycosylated protein continue with the uh, n acetyl glucosamines and mannoses, right? But nature uh, modifies it to its advantage. So there is a there are a number of maturation steps that come uh, um, into play, and um, <clears throat> that typically occurs in the Golgi. Okay, that typically occurs in the Golgi, <clears throat> and so you can have additions. Additions is here. You can have elongations. You can have capping. You can have lots of different steps. A number of these steps play uh, a role, and these are some of the structures that um, that have already been uh, identified, that have been known, that have been known to play important. One of the things is um, uh, that I think what you want to understand primarily, because if you were interested in drug development, you were, if you were interested in uh, understanding uh, developing a protein as a drug. It's important to know that we, for example, mammals, would have structures of this sort, right? Would have structures of this sort if the same protein was to be used from yeast, or the same protein, is there a yeast here? I don't have yeast here, but if the same protein was used from a yeast, the structure, glycosylated, glycosylation structure from yeast expression system might actually be different from what you have here. Okay, so you are going to see differences between human protein. Obviously, bacteria do not typically glycosylate. Um, you know, yeast proteins, you might actually have differences between mammals, a lot of different proteins. For example, antithromin these days is made in sheep, right? So sheep glycosylation is going to be different from human glycosylation and, and things of that sort, okay? So in essence, that's, uh, that's a key part that I want to convey to you. And you want to be uh, in industry if you, for example, um, you know, go and uh, join, then you have to be alert that there will be differences in glycosylation structures. And that might contribute to difference in absorption, bioavailability, uh, distribution, and in addition to affecting the conformation of the protein and interaction and so many different things. <clears throat> okay, I want to highlight that before um, the glycoprotein comes out and becomes fully functional and is amenable for maturation, what happens is something very interesting, uh, that nature has a very important uh, quality control step uh, that governs whether the protein will become, um, you know, functionally relevant. Um, and this is, it is this particular step. So what happens is that you do have this core, but then the protein has to be appropriately folded, right? <clears throat> and so there are so many different chaperones. If, for example, the protein is not appropriately folded, then what happens is there are so many different chaperones. An example here is uh, calnex, calnexin, um, in which the calnexin or calreticulin uh, type of chaperones essentially bind the terminal um, uh, sugar, okay? Essentially bind the terminal sugar. What is this? This is glucose, terminal sugar. And there are three glucose residues that are typically generated and they bind the terminal sugar. There is an extended part that essentially binds hydrophobic residues. So if the protein is, un, um, uh, is unfolded, hydrophobic parts of the protein get exposed, right? You have a chaperone that basically binds the sugar, it captures it, it holds it back, doesn't allow it to be exported from the ER. And then what happens is that the hydrophobic domains, which are exposed because the protein is, is unfolded, they bind to, an, to a site on the chaperone. That organizes the rest of the domains and therefore the protein folds. So in the little time, in the little window that it has, basically the chaperone is able to fold the protein in an appropriate conformation. And there is quality control that goes on. Only if it is folded, if it, then it comes off the chaperone, then the nature says, okay, this is ready to be exported. It comes out and is released. But let's say the protein is not folded appropriately. The time has not been sufficient. It has taken, so it, if it happens with first glucose, um, then it comes back, second glucose, and comes back, third glucose, 
then at some point there are no more glucoses to bind to the uh, to the chaperone at that point basically nature gives up and says that okay can't really fold this well complete so it basically puts it through the proteasome and recycles all the stuff that it has built right so in that fashion it helps uh, quality control with regard to um to the uh, to the glycoprotein expression. Clear? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, there are a lot of different uh, diseases that you know of when proteins uh, are not folded properly. Okay, quite a few. Um, and I think I've listed just a few examples of what happens if the disease is, uh, what happens if the proteins are not folded. Let's not uh, uh, belabor the point here primarily because I think we are a little short of time. Okay, I want to highlight this particular example. I thought it's fascinating. This is from a paper that was published in 2012, and this indicates the specificity of glycan modification of proteins at an appropriate site and what role it has. So neuronal cells, they have a philophobia, that means they have extension and they can actually move around. And um, um, one of the important proteins that contributes to the uh, movement is the intercellular adhesion molecule 5, ICAM5. So the authors were actually trying to understand as to whether glycans are important. And if glycans are important, is there some specificity? So what they did was they simply mutated um, uh, the asparagine residue, which is support, which uh, uh, throughout the you know protein molecule, uh, such that it would not carry a, uh, a glycosyl chain. And notice this: that whereas the asparagines at all other positions when they were mutated do not affect the uh, the extensions of the cells, which is the philopodia, one particular extension at 54 simply makes it completely defective. And that tells you that if you have a glycosyl chain there, most probably that's the one that's going to contribute to the extension, right? And without extension, you won't really have communication and things of that sort. So I thought this was pretty uh, fascinating that, you know, they were, identify, they were able to identify just one position at which the sugar makes all the difference. Okay, uh, O-glycans, very quickly. How much time do we have? 3.49, all right. So I'm going to go for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes more. Um, O-glycans. So just as you have N-glycans, obviously we have O-glycans. The O-glycans, there are quite a few in number. By the way, just because uh, Tamim asked a question earlier about um, GAG binding to proteins, GAG bind through the O group. So styrene is the one to which GAG is connected. But when we talk about N and O-glycans, we typically talk about these kinds of O groups such as N-acetylgalactosamine or N-acetylglucosamine or O-fucose or xylose or mannose, these kinds of things. So these are monosaccharides and then the chains on monosaccharides. These are not really GAGs, right? So there are several different <coughs> types. Um, a distinction has been made, although, um, <coughs> and this is historical, uh, that uh, you know, a particular type are called mucins and these are primarily O, um, uh, galactosamine, um, uh, you know, sugars or proteins that are called uh, mucins. Right? Mucins are extremely important. The word mucin itself is derived from mucus. It basically retains a whole lot of moisture, uh, lubrication, uh, protection. So many different uh, functions are involved out here. <clears throat> they were discovered way back then, and they obviously contain. Uh, sugars, but one of the important residues that they contain is uh, uh, is salic acid that generates <coughs> acidity um, and um, is extremely useful, especially at the epithelial surfaces, primarily because um, it is able to do lubrication, it's able to uh, uh, retain water uh, and things of that sort. So all epithelial surfaces typically would be able to generate uh, mucus. Um, and as you know, I think you all know that heparin is actually produced from mucus, right? Or discarded mucus. <clears throat> and these are uh, shielded uh, from damage and infection. <clears throat> okay. Now, <clears throat> if you don't have sialic acid, um, uh, then, uh, so the N-acetyl galactosamine 
uh, can be modified. I forgot to mention, I think I forgot to mention when I did that. But notice the structures, uh, notice the structures here, for example, right? So you have salic acid, you have salic acid, you have salic acid, you have salic acid, you have salic acid here. And notice all the monosaccharides that are present. These are all galactose and n acetyl galactose amine. Okay, so it's pretty common. Salic acid gets transferred to these kinds of residues. And there are rules for that too, which uh, I'm not going into detail primarily because uh, of lack of time. But in general, um, if the terminal residue is galactosamine, that typically is the simplest, but also generates antigenic response. And there are several different types of antigens already well established that play a significant role um, in immune system. Okay, for example, TN antigen, or for example, T antigen. <clears throat> um, there are several, seven different other cores that are also known in nature, just as galactosamine is a core. Likewise, there are seven different other cores that are known. And then there are numerous modifications uh, that are known. Okay. Um, shown here are just uh, quite a few. And just by the shape and the color uh, thing, you can see that uh, these are quite diverse. <clears throat> okay, I want to talk about one specific um, uh, oglycan, which is turning out to be very important. Yeah, go ahead. Epitope is that region which our system recognizes and then says, oh, this is foreign, and it generates a response. Okay, so there's usually a specific region, either it's a peptide or um, you know domain, um, you know containing uh, sugars, things of that sort. <clears throat> okay. Uh, one uh, specific, Omer, uh, Melissa. Yeah. I, I have a question, Melissa from Wisconsin. Yeah. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering with the biosynthesis of uh, mucin or like not just oclocanac, but just oclocanac in general, are they made in the uh, ER and Golgi, or are they, do you know where they're made and synthesized? Yeah, the ER and Golgi, yeah. Okay, but it's a and totally different o pathway. Sorry, it's the? It's a different pathway from the n glycan, right? That is correct, like, yeah. There are specific enzymes that are involved out there. Okay. Okay. Can we go into it. Oh, <laughs> good question. I'm not going into details of uh, that because there are just too many. I'm, I'm going to discuss, let's see, this particular one, uh, which is actually made not just in the nucleus, uh, but also in the cytoplasm. Okay. Okay. Not, yeah, not just in the ER, which is the O, uh, sorry, N acetyl gluco, uh, uh, glucosylation. N acetyl glucosylation. Okay. Okay. And uh, okay. yeah, I'm not discussing all the others because there are so many different enzymes that are involved, and then it becomes difficult to manage time. Okay. I would recommend that you go through, uh, you know, Ajit Varki's um, uh, chapter. Uh, well, it's not really Ajit Varki. I think I don't remember who's written it, but um, okay. yeah, you go through that book. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so one particular O, um, you know, glycan that I would like to mention is uh, the O gluc methylation, uh, which stands for N acetyl um, glycosylation or glucosylation. And this is distinct from all the ones that we have uh, typically, um, you know, uh, mentioned so far because the O glycans are actually fairly larger than one particular. Uh, residue. This one is just one residue, okay, just one residue. And the reason why I bring it up because it is becoming very clear that this particular modification is extremely important, <clears throat> okay. Well, number one, it just doesn't happen in ER um, uh, and Golgi. It happens in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, okay. It ha also happens in cytoplasm. There are enzymes that could put on one particular residue onto protein CD uh, and there are enzymes that I can actually chop it off. Okay, so there are enzymes that are uh, writers and there are um, <clears throat> enzymes that can remove it. The other important point, and this is very important, is that this particular modification is dynamic. 
Okay, this particular modification is dynamic. That means that you can have a protein that has the O uh, N acetyl glucosamine residue at some point. And then if you were to isolate the same protein at some other time, you may not have it. Because by then it would have been removed. Okay, that's pretty that's very important. Think about the consequences of that. You might be taking cells at certain point of time and you might be trying to identify uh, whether the protein is glycosylated or not. And you may come up with the idea that no, the protein is not glycosylated. But it may so happen that at the point that you have taken the sample, it was not having the um, you know, O N acetyl uh, uh, glucosamine uh, residue. Okay. Why? Because there were some systems that have been placed. So a number of times, most people think that just because the protein doesn't have a sugar, it is not glycosylated at all. That paradigm is not really true at all. You might actually have it glycosylated and taken off. And people are yet to discover. More and more mass spec-based techniques are, become, are being used to identify whether the chain is not, whether the residue is present or not. <clears throat> It appears to be very similar to phosphorylation, okay? And therefore, it actually carries a signal, right? Very important. Uh, and it's actually found on thousands of nucleocytoplasmic proteins. And uh, therefore, this particular residue uh, is extremely important. One of the key points of this um, uh, residue uh, is once it, it can be removed, just as there is a transferase enzyme that can make this kind of sugar, there is a remove, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it, o glacnacase that can actually remove it, right? <clears throat> and what is most important is that the OGT, which is transferase, and the phosphorylase, the one that puts in the pro uh, phosphoryl group, uh, phosphate group, are actually in dynamic equilibrium, okay? So it removes, one removes the phosphate and attaches the o glucnac, and therefore, you can either have o glucnec or you can have a phosphate. In that fashion, uh, it turns out to be a signal. Uh, the interesting part is the enzymes that typically um, you know, put on a phosphate, which are also called kinases, we know that there are innumerable kinases, right? There's an entire assembly of kinases, all different types. Now there are numerous drugs that target, target specific kinases. But think about this, there is one, only one OGT and there is only one O glucnacase. So you can imagine that they actually have fairly broad specificity, extremely interesting. Okay, uh, I know you guys are uh, for you all, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate just very few principles, uh, important points about salic acid. Okay, uh, once again, very important, um, you know, monosaccharide. Um, for us humans. Actually, if you uh, happen to listen to Dr. Waki's presentation, um, um, he typically mentions uh, a number of times that uh, between us and chimpanzees, there is only just one small change uh, in the salic acid, uh, and that's the reason we are so intelligent, but they are not. Well, they are inter intelligent too, but not as much as us. And I'm gonna point out what that small change is. <coughs> So, um, salic acids are actually a big family, okay? quite a large family. Um, they were discovered um, uh, in a nuisance. And as you can imagine, nuisance, as I've already told you, have, for example, galactose and galactosamine, which is decorated with salic acid on the external side as a terminal residue. This is different from all the monosaccharides that we have seen so far. Generally, we have seen six-membered rings. We have not really covered a whole lot of five-membered rings. But this one is a nine-carbon scaffold, okay? Um, it's a keto sugar. <clears throat> and generally, this is, uh, this is classified as salic, or it has been named as salic acid because it had been identified primarily from uh, in the saliva, okay, or mucins from uh, saliva. So that's the reason this is salic acid. As far as you all are concerned with regard to drugs and um, um, the importance of obviously drugs in um, 
in uh, reducing disease state, salic acid is extremely important with regard to influenza. Okay. Influenza virus uh, enters the target host cells in our body through uh, a target, uh, hemagglutinin, for example. But after influenza virus has used all the machinery that we have within our cells, of the, of the target cells, and it has multiplied, it has replicated a whole number, number of times. So one, for example, copy has been made into a thousand copies, and it has converted one influenza virus has now generated, let's say, a thousand influenza viruses. They need to go out, right? They need to go out and infect a whole lot of cells in our body. Then we can have disease. So how does it do that? It comes up on the outside of the target cell. It comes up on the surface, but then, there is an enzyme, neuraminidase, which basically chops it off from, it is, it is held on to the membrane because of these two and it chops it off. And because the salic acid is cleaved, now it is set free and it goes and infects other cells. So this is a beautiful uh, mechanism that, that is at play. The enzyme that is involved here is neuraminidase. Neuraminidase is also a, a, a recognizing element for example, you might have heard a whole lot about how people refer to as this particular influenza was H1N3. The N essentially refers to neuraminidase, the type. Um, there are two major subfamilies of salic acids, for example, uh, N-acetyl neuraminic acid, which is also salic acid, and 2-keto-3 deoxy nonanic acid. Okay. The difference between us and chimpanzees is, for example, that particular group, which is simply not there. Uh, sorry, no, that particular group, which is simply not there in chimpanzees. So that just one oxygen atom is simply not there. And that makes all the difference. Okay. And I think um, Dr. Warty highlights it a whole lot. Uh, what is the difference that arises because of this particular aspect? and people have not as yet been able to pinpoint. <clears throat> but it's pretty interesting. Salic acids, as I said, are the terminal recipes um, in a number of different types of glycans. And these are, these are some of the common ones that you can see uh, with regard to the location of salic acid. As you can see, for example, in N and O glycans, in several other types of antigens, in, um, uh, and for example, in alpha-2,3 linked, salic acid, uh, glycans. Um, there are several different enzymes that are typically um, involved in transfer of salic acids. And <clears throat> these enzymes have their own specificity uh, that come into play. There are uh, uh, alpha-2-3 salic transferases, alpha and the next slide. I'm going quickly primarily because I want to uh, save a little bit of time. Alpha-2-6, uh, once again, salic transferases, these have extremely important roles. There are a number of different structures that come into play. Um, <clears throat> uh, some get transferred to galactose, some others transfer to galactosamines. <clears throat> and um, depending on the base scaffold, depending on the base interglycosidic linkages, you get transferred to an appropriate site. <clears throat> So specificity of the substrate or the structure of the substrate is also extremely important. And <clears throat> likewise, you can have alpha-2,8 linked solid glycans too. Now here it, it happens that when the linkage is alpha-2,8, then you can actually have multiple salic acid chains that keep building and you actually have polysalic acid structure that is generated. In our body, these structures are localized at specific sites, and therefore there is a recognition element that also comes into play. Okay? So it's not just one salic acid. You can actually have multiple salic acid. And this, once again, is generated by several different types of enzymes, uh, which are expressed in a spatiotemporal manner. <clears throat> the salic acid sort of siloam, okay, the number of structures that are possible within the family of salic acids is also huge. So just as I keep telling you that there are a number of different monosaccharides, likewise, within salic acid structures, which has an acidic group, there are a number of different types of salic acids. And these are put on to substrates at several different points 
so that once again you generate multiple structures and that is called silo okay and that is huge <clears throat> okay. you might be um, interested to know that there is one particular uh, structure uh, that has caught the attention of a lot of people <clears throat> including those who want to <clears throat> reduce uh, the population and that is Salil Lewis X. Why is it important? Primarily because this particular motif as shown here, this is the salic acid, okay? This is the galactose and then the rest of the group. This salic acid, um, this particular structure right, um, is extremely important because in the step where the egg is fertilized, the recognition element is Salil Lewis X. So that's extremely important. So whereas on one hand, um, you know, we may think uh, that uh, the fertilization uh, uh, is essentially not as well dependent simply because there are too many sperms and one of them simply, you know, succeeds. That's not really the case. The one that has an appropriate structural feature actually helps it succeed. And that is Sal and Lewis X. And likewise, there are other numerous examples of where Salin Lewis structure is also uh, extremely important, <clears throat> which I'm not highlighting. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is the last slide that I have taken from the Salic acid lecture. But if you want to know a little bit more about Salic acids, the Salome, the recognition, how the Salome is actually presented on the lipid bilayer, uh, and things of that sort, then I think please refer to the slides that I have for you on Blackboard. Okay, there are quite a few. I think I have about 20, 28 or slides or so on salic acid. Very fascinating field uh, and extremely important. Uh, and at least I think we have seen two examples, one in which influenza, uh, salic acid play a role, and then salic Lewis X. And both of those are very specific, right? So I hope you are getting the idea. The idea that I'm trying to present to you is that it is not that glycos uh, it is not that gag, uh, uh, glycans are diverse, glycans are numbers are huge, and they could generally play a role, right? But there are some very specific roles that glycans play. And I think what I'm trying to highlight is every now and then I'm going to present to you specific structures doing specific function, which is extremely important. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so what is the So they are trying to develop. So basic simple thing is that if you if you want to essentially prevent fertilization, what would you do? You would mimic this structure, right? And so if it is there at the right time, you have mimicked it, but basically it is a decoy, you would prevent fertilization. Very simple, right? Of course, mimicking this structure is not easy, right? It requires a lot of research. Okay, very good. Um, Let's uh, move on to glycans as drugs. I think every lecture I'm trying to hit upon glycans and drugs. And so what I've done is I have um, assembled at least a list of glycans as drugs. And this is of special interest to me because I would like um, to discover principles that can help um, you know, move glycans into the clinic. And um, what I've tried to do in this, let's go to the uh, learning objective. So what I've tried to do is to help you understand as to what should you think about when you think about glycans and drugs, right? Um, obviously, um, by now you probably know there are very few glycans that have actually succeeded in the clinic, right? Very, very few glycans. So why is that? So those are the principles that we should think about. And we should also look at the glycans that have actually been approved as drugs, and there are not very many. <clears throat> All right, so this, these are the topics that we're going to cover. Let's just skip this for the time being. <clears throat> I covered one uh, in one slide. Umesh? Yeah. Hi, this is Wasim. I think you may have moved the, the screen off or the PowerPoint off the screen. We can't see it anymore, we, or we can only see the partial right side. Uh-uh. Something happened. Oh, it's back. 
Yeah, when we get in. We see it here. I don't know why they don't see it there. What are you doing? We had it for a second until you closed it. No, but that was a previous lecture. So they need to see this. I can't really move it. Not showing anything is what they said. Share. Okay. That's it. That's it. Perfect. Very simple. I should have known. Okay. Very good. Okay, Watim, can you um, see it now? Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay. So, um, I like to divide the glycosamino, uh, sorry, I like to divide the glycan binding proteins into two major categories, as you heard me in the teaser uh, lecture that, um, you know, I had. One is where, for example, those are pro these proteins bind to N and O glycans. Right. Generally speaking, we recognize them as lectins, right? And there is no universal classification of lectins, but there are several different similar lectins that have been put together, and we have L-type lectins, C-type lectins, R-type lectins, I-type lectins, P-type lectins, galactins, and so many others. And there is a reason for all of these, right? Those that are derived from plants, some that are dependent on calcium, some that recognize sialic acid, uh, which are also called uh, <clears throat> ciglex, uh, some that recognize nano 6 phosphate, um, and some that recognize galactose, right, or especially beta galactose. And so those are that's the loose categorization, and there are quite a few, and they play a significant role in a number of different things. Um, uh, immunoglobin like lectins, they play a role in immune response, things of that sort. The second major category that I like to think about is glycosaminoglycan binding lectins, right? So heparan sulfate binding proteins, chondroitin sulfate binding proteins, things of that sort. And within that, there are a large number of uh, families of proteins that recognize glycosaminoglycans. So when we talk about drugs, a very simplistic thing to think about is that there are so many proteins that are involved in glycan recognition then theoretically, we should be able to target these proteins so that either the binding is enhanced or binding is weakened. And therefore, you should have molecules that would you know, inter, uh, interfere or, uh, or uh, 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 you know, serve as agonists uh, to these you know, systems and therefore succeed in the clinic. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna show you the list in just a little while, but they're not very many. Why? Glycans are typically extremely difficult to put in, put in the clinic, right? Very difficult. Very, very few molecules have actually succeeded. And one of the reasons is uh, that glycans typically do not have high affinity for their protein targets. Typically, if you talk about monosaccharide binding to an NNO glycan protein, for example, uh, you know, mannose recognizing lectin or glucose recognizing lectin. A monosaccharide typically has very poor affinity. Sometimes it could be micromolar, but a number of times it could actually be millimolar affinity, which means in terms of drugs, you know, these kinds of things might not really. The way nature uses these as a recognition system is this particular principle. What is this principle? This principle is that if nature wants to identify, recognize a monosaccharide, then it forms a multimeric protein entity, which recognizes four monosaccharides all at the same time. And that's a beautiful principle that you all might know from your undergrad days. This principle is called the neighboring group effect. Just because you have an appropriate recognition, the neighbor, the second recognition is significantly enhanced. So when you have an uh, association, a multimer formation, then the recognition is much, much more enhanced for the second, even more for the third, and then even more for the fourth. So nature uses it. <clears throat> for example, this particular lectin called concannabinol A uh, is actually a tetramer that binds to terminal mannose. 
and it recognizes four manoses. In that fashion, the affinity uh, becomes much, much higher. So this is one principle. This is how nature exploits it. <clears throat> and in order to discover something, you have to keep this principle in mind. Oligomerization or clustering or multimerization is extremely important. It actually raises the affinity more than 100 fold. Actually, in some cases, even uh, you know, uh, 10,000 fold, right? Even 10,000 fold. The number of cases that have been uh, discovered where you can have an affinity uh, that enhances because of uh, multimerization. And generally, all of these are actually multimers. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, um, a number of times you have to be always um, so be always careful that when you do protein structure elucidation, protein structure uh, comparison, that you might actually have same protein structure, but the recognition of a glycan might be different. It might actually recognize different, um, you know, glycans, mannose versus galactose. For two proteins that have essentially very similar sequences, you might actually have recognition of two different types of glycans. How does it arise? It arises primarily because of overall uh, shape of the binding site. So in a number of cases, for example, you have the binding site residues, certain binding site residues are very similar, but the way in which the oligosaccharide is arranged in the binding site, or for example, <clears throat> different types of lectins out here is different. So this one recognizes mannose or glucose, and you can see the arrangement is different from the arrangement out here. And that's extremely important. This is an added difficulty with regard to discovering something highly specific, right? You realize the challenge? That now we are really talking about different proteins having essentially similar structure, recognizing different ligands. Right? And therefore, that is something that you always have to keep in mind, which is also one of the reasons why <clears throat> not many glycans have actually come into the clinic. So discrimination, sorry, I forgot to mention, discrimination arises from an altered geometry <clears throat> and not necessarily from an altered binding site. Okay, so this is a reorientation of the ligand that occurs in the binding site, although the binding site is exactly very similar, not exactly similar, very similar. Got it? Am I clear? Am I making sense? Okay, no response. In, right. When when you say gags, I know you know we are interested in gags, but we are talking about glycans, N and O glycans here. Okay. I'm going to show you how the complexity with regard to gags too. In just a little while. <clears throat> okay, glycans, I already made a statement. Glycans have poor affinity in general for their proteins, right? Um, and that is a challenge in terms of drugs discovery. That is absolutely, and then in terms of anything to do with recognition, that's a challenge. For example, you might want to, um, you know, come up with a microarray, right? Uh, that is definitely a challenge. But um, you always have to remember that you can differentiate glycans based on orientation of the different OH groups, but also remember that certain glycans present essentially no polar atoms, may not present polar atoms in one of the interfaces, one of the one of the phases. Okay, for example, out here you might have all the hydroxy groups that are oriented above the plane, whereas underneath the plane, there is a fairly hydrophobic site. And so whereas the earlier ones I was telling you of the challenges, you can exploit these kinds of subtle differences. They are very, very subtle differences uh, that you can theoretically exploit. And there have been a number of examples that have ju done just that. <clears throat> okay, let's discuss a little bit of water. Right, water being extremely important, we are doing everything in water, and water um, plays a significant role. I mean, you would never have a protein without water, right? Obviously, proteins do not really, you know, function without water. So, a protein molecule is usually covered in water. 
and a lot more waters are present in protein. Some of them are bound really tightly, some of them are free. There are several different shells of water molecules. In the binding site, or the glycan binding site, the glycan has to go in and in that fashion has to remove water, right? So glycan, think of this, in, in a physical sense, what is happening? The glycan molecule is actually rotating freely, it's moving around, and then it binds to the binding site. In that fashion, its rotation or movement is restricted. So therefore, what is happening? It is engaging in interactions, which generates an enthalpic form, right? But it is being restricted in movement. So there's an entropic penalty. Entropy, entropy means movement of the molecule. So there are two competing aspects. At the same time, with regard to uh, proteins that by glycan, once the glycan binds, water molecules are released. So now water molecules that had restricted motion have now come free. So now water molecules are basically able to move around freely. So there is an entropic gain upon release of water molecules. So there are several things that come into play when we think about targeting glycan binding proteins. And therefore, one has to think about how many water molecules are actually released when the molecule that you're trying to design or trying to discover actually binds the protein. <clears throat> so every water molecule gives you few kilocalories per mole. So if, for example, the delta G was four kilocalories to start with, per mole to start with, that essentially means the affinity was about 1.2 millimolar. But in this process, if one molecule of water is released, and this is tightly bound water, which typically gives high energy, then the binding affinity goes down by 42 micromolar. If two water molecules are released, it will go to about 1.5 micromolar. So affinity increases dramatically. And if three water molecules are released, the affinity would increase to 51 nanomolar. In order for drugs, in order for a molecule to succeed as a drug, most of the time, people look at nanomolar affinity, right? So in terms of drugs, and design, you have to always consider about targeting sites in which there are bound water molecules that can be released upon the molecule that you're trying to design, binding to it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, generally speaking, because you have more water molecules released versus one glycan being bound, the water molecule release typically gives you higher energy, okay? At the same time, you have to remember that the glycan delta H, which is the enthalpic energy, when whatever molecules that you're binding, if that enthalpic energy uh, is not that high, which is also possible, we are trying to replace to a glycan binding site. Once again, the water, release of water molecules becomes extremely important. So uh, in a number of studies, this has been documented a number of times, that the uh, entropic, this system is entropically, typically entropically governed, of which water molecule release is one of the most important ones. Okay? <clears throat> All right, let's talk about glycosaminoglycan binding uh, proteins and principles thereof. <clears throat> the challenge here is that glycosaminoglycan bind typically to highly electropositive surfaces, right? These are highly negatively charged molecules, sulfate groups and acid, uh, uh, carboxylic acid groups. And when they recognize proteins, typically you have to have multiple positive charges that are present in the binding site. And where are the positive charges present on proteins? They're typically present on the outside. And they, therefore the sites are not very deep. The sites are shallow and that's the recognition issue. So what happens because of this, is that a particular glycosamine or glycan might actually bind in multiple sites. And in comparable proteins, you can actually have completely different binding geometry. What I'm showing you here is, for example, heparin pentasaccharide, which is the green sticks, which is bound to factor 9A, which is this orientation. And similar molecule binding to thrombin, which is in this orientation. And factor 9A and thrombin are very similar. So this is an overlay, over, overlay of both proteins. And you can see that there is a completely different binding mode. And this could actually become very important. 
Okay. So this is another challenge. How do you actually discover something that you could be realizing in the clinic? <laughs> um, uh, let's skip this, okay? Because I did discuss uh, did discuss this when we did the teaser slide. Okay. Now, in terms of recognition with regard to gags, you have to remember that uh, there are various ways in which interactions arise. One is a straight positive negative charge interaction. This interaction is called Coulombic interaction, right? straight. And there is no directionality associated with it. You can have similar interaction from any direction. Okay, as long as the distance is maintained, you can get that interaction. So there is no specificity that is involved out here. When does directionality come into play? Directionality comes into play when there is a hydrogen bond. So you can actually have a sulfate group interacting with an positively charged amine in which a hydrogen is sandwiched, a proton is sandwiched, and this could be a hydrogen bond. This is a bent hydrogen bond. Normally hydrogen bonds like to be completely linear, for example, of this type. So higher the number of these kinds of interactions, higher the affinity, higher the specificity, right? And it's not always that you would get something of this sort. So in terms of drug discovery, this is another major challenge, <clears throat> okay? With regard to sulfate groups, you also have to remember that not only are we to now think about water release, but sulfate groups are typically not sulfate SO3 minus alone or SO3H alone. Sulfate groups typically have SO3 minus Na plus. So when your molecule goes and binds, the sodium also gets released. And therefore the sodium or whatever cation is, that species, entropic contribution would also come into play, okay? So therefore, you also always have to think about these kinds of things. <clears throat> um, with regard to gags, it is always that higher number of interactions typically arise primarily because you have in the binding pocket a number of different positively charged residues. For example, in this case, this is antithromine, by the way. <clears throat> For example, here you have a series of positively charged residues, lysine 125, arginine 129. This is only for antithrombin. But generally, you're going to see glycosonoglycan glycan binding proteins have multiple positively charged residues that line the pocket. Okay? Now, how does nature try to overcome all this uh, and yet generate specific interaction? And we are talking about the limited area of glycosaminoglycan. glycan. Nature tries to do it through a powerful mechanism in which there is ternary complexation. So the, on the other side, NNO-glycans, I told you, how does nature try to overcome poor specificity by forming multimer aggregates? Here, nature tries to overcome specificity by engineering a ternary complexation where the polymer, the glycosaminoglycan, in this case heparin, actually forms a bridge. So the interactions out here, which is with thrombin, for example, and the interactions out here, which is with antithrombin, both of these interactions determine whether heparin and thrombin, uh, sorry, antithrombin and thrombin would come in close to each other and be nullified. Both of those interactions, right? So in that fashion, you are eliminating a whole lot of proteases from the system. Because remember, what, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say that because this particular system is highly specific, because the heparin antithrombin system is highly specific, that antithrombin recognition of thrombin now becomes part of the heparin system to determine as to what would be inhibited. You get it? So this is how nature tries to use, overcome the specificity issue with regard to uh, glycosaminoglycan. Once again, I know it's a little complicated. <clears throat> what am I trying to say? That in heparin, you have a specific pentasaccharide. That specific pentasaccharide has to be that structure. If it is not that structure, then it won't recognize antithrombin. Point number one. Point number two, if you have this structure, antithrombin binds. But then antithrombin recognition of thrombin is dictated by whatever residues are here. So now what happens? Heparin 
uses antithrombin's recognition to basically target thrombin. In that fashion, it says that, oh, this is the only one that will get inhibited. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but I think I'm trying to illustrate the principle about how nature tries to overcome the lack of specificity in, in these kinds of glycans, NNO glycans as well as glycosaminoglycans. glycans. Right? Clear? Okay. And, and you, you see this repeatedly. This is actually true for a large number of systems. This, for example, is the um, FGF2, FGF1 heparin system, which is highly involved in growth. Uh, it forms a ternary complexation. There are several different types of ternary complexes that are known. You can clearly see that these two structures are different, right? See that these two structures are different. They're not the same. And the reason is this is FGFR1. This is FGFR2, FGF1, FGF2. So those two are actually different systems. And in both, you have ternary complexation. But the way in which these are organized is completely different. So that's how specificity is engineered. Got it? Yeah? Okay. All right, one final point, which I think all of you uh, probably know, glycans are highly water soluble in general. That is a major issue. Why? Because the log P is negative. When you have something that is highly negatively charged or highly water soluble, log P is negative. Therefore, transport across lipid bilayers is extremely difficult. Therefore, oral bioavailability is typically very low, right? So, you can see what I've illustrated to you is other than one or two principles, I've illustrated a whole lot of not good for drugs, not good for drugs, not good for drugs across the board, right? Which is one of the reasons why glycans have not, no, not too many glycans have made it to the clinic, obviously. <clears throat> you know, we are trying to change that, but, and there are quite a few people that are trying to change that. By the way, there are uh, close to uh, 10 companies in the US that are focused on glycan based drugs okay, now. So it's already growing. And since the time we started, which was about 20 years ago, at that time, there were only about one or two companies. So more and more people are coming into the field, which actually is very good uh, for uh, glycans as drugs. <clears throat> okay, very quickly, um, this is a slide that you have seen so many times, glycosaminoglycans glycans. Uh, within that category, heparin is a drug, has been a drug. Uh, likewise, low molecular weight heparin is a, are drugs. Pondaparinex, which is a specific five residue sequence, is a drug. Uh, hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid is also a drug, okay? used for osteoarthritis primarily, as well as wound healing. Chondroitin sulfate glucosamine is a drug, um, and it's also a um, supplement. Uh, so it's basically freely available if you go to stores. <clears throat> I want to quickly uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, glycan-based drugs with regard to diabetes. Uh, Alpha-glucosidase is the enzyme that typically chops off um, um, you know, sugars, glucoses from starch polymers. And we now have several molecules that are targeting alpha glucosidase, acarbose, miglitol, and <clears throat> voglibose. The basic mechanism here is that uh, alpha glucosidase um, cleaves the polymer, cleaves the end, sorry, cleaves the last, oops, cleaves the terminal residue of the polymer, which is a glucose and it releases that residue, that residue is then quickly absorbed. And the turnover number is very high in terms of every second there are 100,000 molecules that are being generated by the action of alpha glucosidase. And then alpha glucosidase works on the next residue, and then on the next residue. In that fashion, it keeps releasing the monosaccharide which are absorbed. Um, so the intermediate, the transition state intermediate is this one. Okay, where you have a carbonium ion, uh, we have an oxonium ion that is formed, and it, therefore it generates a planar structure. Now, using this logic, they have actually come up with uh, several molecules. Uh, a carbose is one molecule, which is a tetrasaccharide with a double bond, right? So, although this is a scaffold which is sugar, 
this cap hold is not really sugar because that doesn't have an oxygen but still we can we can claim it as a sugar molecule these two are not really sugars okay because there is no nuclear oxygen atom here there is an n but there is no oxygen and here there are no oxygens but generally speaking we can still say well these are sugar like so these are called these are called pseudo sugars okay these are pseudo sugars and they mimic that uh, oxonium uh, intermediate. Um, I did discuss uh, neuraminidase and influenza. So based on that, uh, the recognition of uh, sialic acid and the intermediate that is actually formed in sialic acid, I don't have the intermediate here, <clears throat> but this is the recognition element. So based on that, the first molecule that was Design was Zenobi. Actually, it's not the first molecule. It was the end molecule, but the one that actually succeeded in the clinic. And you can see that once again, there is a um, planar structure at the site in which you have uh, uh, deglycosylation that's going on. And from that, an easier molecule, which is currently used in the clinic, which is Tamiflu, was discovered. Right. So that's the element. And once again. Uh, this particular agent is not really a sugar, right? There is no nuclear oxygen, but it is a pseudo sugar. So therefore we claim it to be a sugar. <clears throat> there are a large number of, uh, not large, there are at least a few uh, of sugar-like molecules that have made into the cl clinic, which is one of them is topiramate, miglostat and mannitol, as well as a um, <clears throat> uh, couple of uh, others. Miglostat <coughs> treats type 1 Gaucher's disease. Okay, you're going to learn about this uh, in the slide on lysosomal storage disorders. Um, <coughs> this is an anticonvulsant used for epilepsy. And mannitol is a diuretic. Uh, so if you have too much mannitol, mannitol cannot really cross the you know, kidney lining. So there's a lot of water <coughs> that is reabsorbed, uh, sodium that is reabsorbed. And that um, uh, basically leads to significant loss of water. So um, that's how mannitol is used. <laughs> so overall, um, you know, we have not as many drugs that are glycan-based in the clinic. Okay? And I alluded to you a little bit of challenges. But as we discover more and more of specific places where glycans play a role. So one of the major things that we have to keep in mind is that people had not really identified specific roles of glycosomal, uh, specific role of glycans. And that's the major thing. Biology had not developed as much in order for chemists to really come up with something that would target specific sites. <clears throat> in addition to the fundamental challenges in terms of chemistry of discovering drugs. Anyway, um, the issues that are challenging are oral bioavailability, weaker forces, large scaffolds. I didn't talk about glycan and synthesis at all. In fact, this course, we are not talking about synthesis of glycans at all uh, because it's extremely challenging and it's highly need-based. If you need a particular structure, normally you have to make it. There are, no, there are very, very few generalized tools to make a molecule. <clears throat> so it's actually a very, very niche area. And yet, I would like to say that there are major opportunities to discover glycan-based drugs, as long as we understand biology and as long as we utilize the principles that govern glycan recognition of proteins. Okay, with that I end. Um, any questions? None? Everything's clear? Too much bewildered by challenges? All right. Very good. So we meet uh, next Monday at three. Okay, on the web. Everything Thank okay? you. No, All right. that was great. Okay, very good. Bye for now.